our theme for this entire um, mm -hmm. gospel meeting is faith is the victory because faith without faith one cannot have salvation and uh, we are covering the gospel plan of salvation throughout this entire meeting so without further ado faith is the victory number 469 in the gray book that we are using cj and i called songs of faith and praise faith is the victory Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall pale the glowing skies. Against the foe in vales below, let all our strength be held. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph run. By faith they like a whirlwind's breath, swept on or every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the world, oh, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, we'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. Amen. Uh, don't quite show the slide just yet. I mean, oh, you don't want that yet? I'm having trouble with the code here. Oh, and I forgot to pull up my, my uh, clicker. Yes. Flicker, flicker. Five, eight, seven, six, four, eight. Uh, you'll have to give that to me a minute because it wasn't up yet. <coughs> Five, eight, seven. Six, four, eight. All righty. I think I got. Yep. Looks like I've got some. Uh, Control, are we ready then? Great, yeah. All right, here we go, guys. The gospel plan of salvation, God's way. We are dealing with uh, the aspect of repentance. Just as a recap of our former three lessons, um, we learned the first night that Jesus is the foundation of our belief or our faith, as seen in 1 Corinthians 3.11, wherein Paul tells the Corinthians, For no other foundation can any man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
we know that faith that our faith in Jesus is primary that we need to hear him for Paul says in Romans chapter 10 verse 17 that faith cometh by hearing and hearing through the word of God so therefore faith is the result of hearing the word of God and Jesus is that foundational truth of our faith we must hear the word of God the word being Jesus we talked about how we must hear and believe that he is Hebrews 11 verse 6 for without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that seek him as we talked about again on ver on uh, night number two so we showed how we must hear and believe not just that he is that he exists that he is the word of God that he has the words of God but that we must that he rewards those who seek him that he that we must seek him first he is the way the truth and the life no man no man no one comes to God except through him now as we then went into night number two night number three last night we covered exactly what we are to hear in regards to Jesus and what we are exactly we are to believe for we learned that uh, sin is one of the primary messages we learned the definition of sin James 4 17 therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not that is sin we learned that sin is a transgression of the law first John chapter 3 and verse 4 we learned also last night that the application of sin when Paul states in Romans 3 and verse 23 that all have sinned every single one of us have committed sin we there have been times when we have known to do good and we have not done it we have therefore transgressed the law of God there are times when we have just outright transgressed the law of God we learn the consequences of sin Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 state that our sins separated us from God separated us remember that all of us have sinned therefore all of us stand separated from God and therefore as Romans 6 23 which we did not cover last night <clears throat> but we're thrown in there for free tonight uh, as Romans 6 and verse 23 states the wages of sin is death so therefore the consequence of sin is death our death our spiritual death our physical death but God provided a solution to sin for while we were yet sinners Paul says in Romans 5 and verse 8 Christ died for our sins yours and mine and this is the good news for you see not only is the wages of sin death but the free gift that God offers is eternal life through Christ Jesus his son Romans 6 and 23 what is the gospel then that we need to hear we need to believe the gospel since we are all convicted of sin there is good news that God has provided that that salvation that gospel well the gospel we can see is the death burial and resurrection of Christ for that is what has been preached from the beginning of the church in fact in Acts chapter 10 verses 34 through 43 Cornelius would receive that gospel of Peter Peter preached the gospel how that Christ was was crucified hung on a tree for our sins and that he was buried and raised the third day Paul says that I delivered to you first Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 8 that which I received that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and raised the third day according to our scripture according to the scriptures that he was seen 
of Cephas and the twelve and of five hundred of people at one time and of the apostle, all the apostles and of me as of one coming born out of due time. Paul says there in is the gospel, the good news. Christ has died for our sins. God has provided a way for us to be saved. Lastly, we also looked how the gospel requires a response from every hearer. We turned and we looked in Matthew 13, verses 18 through 22 at the parable of the sower, and we saw how there were four different types of soil that the seed fell upon as the sower sowed it. The sower just simply cast it out. He went about his world on his way and he spread the news. He spread the seed. Now, there was four responses. Those that heard it at the wayside, where it landed at the wayside, listened, but they didn't attend. They didn't understand it. They didn't comprehend it. They didn't take the time to meditate upon it. And as such, there was the, the Satan took it out of their hearts out of their ears. Then there was the rocky soil. They attended, and after a while, they received it with joy. They finally understood it, but they weren't fully convicted. For after a while, for after a bit, then the cares of the world sprung up, the persecutions, I should say, of the world sprung up and then took out the, the roots because their roots were so shallow. Well, then there was the response of the thorny, where they attended where they attended and they listened to the gospel. They heard it, they understood it, they received it with joy, but they allowed the cares of the world to snatch that seed away, to distract them. They became so distracted by the things around them, by what went on, the situations they were all in, that they just were gone. They fell away. And then you have the good soil. These people attended, they heard it, they listened to it, they understood it, they meditated upon it, they comprehended it, they waited in the balances, they received it, and they bore fruit. It demands a response from each and every one of us. Come on, clicker. Then we turn to Matthew 27, verses 21. And 23. And this is where I really want to begin and, and pick up with you tonight. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 and verses 21 through 23. Notice what the response was of these individuals. Not everyone, Jesus said, Jesus says this, guys. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that low day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And I'll profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They may have claimed to be doing the stuff in the name of Christ. They may have been claiming to do the things, the casting out demons and devils and, and doing wonderful works in the name of Christ. But they weren't doing the will of his Father in heaven and what does that mean their response was they were not obedient to the will of the father and they were not guaranteed entrance into the kingdom of heaven and so as we talk about tonight uh we really what Levi was hinting at and what we talked about with the gospel seed in Matthew uh, in, in Matthew I'm drawing a blank. What was that one Levi helped me out? Matthew 13 with the soils there has to be a response. And but, so tonight we want to look at the beginning uh, phases of that response to the gospel. And we want to turn our attention to repentance. 
Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. I change my mind about something and then I, uh, I'm not going to do this sin anymore. And then it leads me to action. It leads me to uh, disregard that sin. And, and really, uh, we, we want to look at the message, the, the fundamental message as the gospel was preached when it was first delivered. And when we see in Mark chapter 3 and verse 4, John the Baptist, or John, John the Baptizer, uh, as he's preparing the way for Jesus, sa says this, in Matthew 3, 1 and 2, he, he says, In those days, John... In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, The pint gives of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one cried in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his uh, straight. So, so we see John the Baptist's message was to repent. And, and when we sandwich that, we go, go, go a little farther into the gospel and, and we see Jesus uh, not many days after in Mark 1 15 preaching the same thing uh, notice with me and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand repent ye and believe in the gospel so John told people to repent and uh, turn away Jesus said repent and believe in the gospel and we we have this message group graduating even after the uh cross before before jesus's ministry during jesus's ministry and now after in acts 2 38 then peter signed them Repent and be baptized, every one of you. So, so the fundamental message uh, of the gospel starts with repentance. We see it with John, we see it with Jesus, and we see it with Peter. And, and so what is really repentance? And I think tonight we're going to really define repentance and look at some of these facets in four different ways. And first, we would like you to consider with us tonight that repentance is turning away in attitude and in action. Well, look with me. Uh, uh, Acts 19, uh, Acts 3, 12 through 19, excuse me. Acts chapter 3, 12 through 19. Uh, one, one more verse. And, and when Peter saw it, he answered them to the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man walk? So in the context, Peter and John went into the 
temple and, and made a lame man to walk. And, and um, we love him there in Solomon's court, it says. And, and so he continues and continues delivering the gospel message. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when it was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and the desire the murder to be granted unto you. And kill the Prince of Life, who God has raised from the dead, and is named through faith, and in, in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of all. And now, brethren, I will. Well, that though in ignorance you, you did it, uh, as did also you rulers. But those things which God before had shewed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, and he hath the fulfilled. And, and stop there for just a second. This is the message. This is the message that's preached throughout the entirety of the book of Acts. It's preached on the day of Pentecost. It's preached here. It's preached in Acts 10. Uh, and the entirety of the message is you killed Jesus and God raised him. You killed them, God raised them. And, and we'll look at Peter's call for a response to the people in verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of the flesh shall come from the presence of the Lord, so what, what do we do about killing the Messiah? Repent. Be converted. Change your ways. Be, be, be a whole new person. Change in attitude and in action. And look with me again at Jesus' message. Jesus his message in Mark 1, 14 and 15 was to re repent ye and believe in the gospel. Change your ways. Believe in the gospel. And no notice repentance is coupled with something else. It's not repent and don't do it anymore. Repent and turn your attention to something else. Why is that important to not only turn away, but turn to something? Well, if you don't have anything to turn to, you're just going to be drawn back. So uh, all of the... Uh, accounts, Acts 3, repent and be converted, something else. Mark 1, repent and believe in the Gospels. A and we, we see here in, in Acts 26, 12 to 20, uh, another uh, message that, that the apostles give and, and if you could bring that up for me, thank you. Um, well, 
Well, so, so, we're, we're just gonna, well, we'll, we'll read it real fast. Well, Will Potter said, went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest. At midnight, O king, I saw in the way light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining around about me, and none was strained with me, and when we were all fall to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and said, So, so, why, do, why persecutest thou me? Is it hard for thee to cake against the bricks? And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But my, stand on my feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of these things in which I appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. <laughs> to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness and from the power of Satan unto God that they may uh, re receive the uh, forgiveness of sins and inheritance among the, them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Uh, would, would you mind uh, finishing up 19 and 20? Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, <laughs> but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. So, so again, Saul... So tells us the conversion, his conversion story. I was on the road, the Lord appeared to me, and eventually he says, you're going to be a witness of what you've seen and heard. And uh, I think what Paul's saying is, he's telling the story in hopes that, and, and you can... Uh, Step in here if I'm wrong, uh, Levi, in, in hopes that people will uh, repent and turn to God and learn from his conversion. Uh, that, uh, that, that's why I think Saul is t telling his experience to lead others to believe in. And uh, yeah, in, in verse. 26, 28, then a group of seven to Paul almost that persuaded me to be a Christian. So, so he's telling his account, his conversion story, in hopes that people will come to repentance. And again, that is the gospel message that we need to repent. And a huge Jesus. That's the first step. And, and again, uh, what works of repentance, notice in verse 20, what works are an outward display of an inward re repentance. But so is should first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. They are doing the works because They've already repented. They're, they're not doing the, the works to, to 
we we put they've already changed their mind and now he is the need to change your behavior. So so uh so repentance is turning away in attitude and in sentence saying I'm not going to do this instead I'm going to do that. So we see that repentance is not just a turning away in attitude and action, but it's a turning away in attitude and action because we are convicted of sin. You know, we talked earlier about how uh, sin, every one of us has done, Romans 3.23, every single one of us. But Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, when the people in on the day of Pentecost heard Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, uh, actually, we're going to back up and start in verse 36. Uh, we see that in Acts 36, therefore, Peter says, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, he just pointed the finger at them. You have murdered God's Christ. You have murdered your Lord, the Lord that God anointed. Now, think about what that means to the people. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were convicted of their sin. Paul or Peter has just spent this entire uh, sermon telling them and leading them to that point that they had murdered the Christ of God, the Messiah, the one they had been waiting for for generations. And they were convicted of it through the scriptures. Peter says unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. And they're in the name of the Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You want to make it right, repent. You got to turn from your sin because you are convicted of your sin. Notice as we continue on through that passage into verse 41. Okay, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. He was calling them to an action. An action based upon that conviction of sin. Save yourselves from your sins. From the way that the rest of this generation is going. And they that gladly received his word. Remember the story of the sower? They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. There were people that were convicted of their sin. And they turned and made that change in their lives, in their heart, because they were convicted of sin. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 24. We have here the story of the recounting of, uh, <clears throat> of Simon the sorcerer at uh, Samaria. We're in Acts chapter 8. I got to check and see what exactly. Uh, Okay, Acts chapter 8, verse 24, or 18 through 24. Then Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither lot 
Uh, partner lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For you see, Simon was a sorcerer. He was one that had built up a big power base. Verse 9 was where we're introduced in, in the same chapter, Acts 8 and verse 9. A certain man called Simon, which before time in the city used sorcery, bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. And they all listened to him. They gave him high regard because of how long he had been bewitching them with sorceries. But when then Philip came and, and preached the things of the kingdom in the name of Jesus Christ, they obeyed. He lost his power base. But he also believed now. Notice this. Simon himself all believed also. Okay. And he believed as well. And when Peter and them came down and laid their hands on them, received the Holy Spirit, what did Simon do? He saw that and he desired that power, that authority. He maybe, wanted the same power. Maybe he wanted the power based that. That's very possible. For he says, give me this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter says, you are in the bounds of bitterness. Really? See there? Verse 23. Thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. What does Simon say, though? Look at the courage that Simon has here. Simon the sorcerer says, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. Simon repented. Right there. Simon was convicted of his sin. But you see, the Apostle Peter says, Repent of this wickedness and pray to God that it might be forgiven you. If you don't repent, you're not going to be forgiven. If you're not convicted of your sins, you're not going to repent. You see how that builds one stone upon the other. If you're not convicted of the sin in your life, you're not going to repent. If you're not going to repent of the wickedness and the sin in your life, you're not going to be forgiven. You're not going to be praying to God and doing what God says that it might be forgiven you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. We have another aspect of it. As Peter, or excuse me, as Paul, in 2 Corinthians 12, 19 through 21, is writing to the church at Corinth, and he says here, Again, thank you that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things, dearly beloved, for your edifying. We're not doing this for our own profit. We're doing it for your profit, he says. I fear lest when I come, I'm going to find, I'm not going to find you as I want you to be. Rather, I'm going to find you in such a way that I'm going to have to be to you that as you don't want me to be. Lest there be debates and envyings and wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. And lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and I shall bewail many that have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they've committed. Paul says, turn you away from what you used to do, from the way you used to be. Repent. Okay, so that when I come, I don't have to chew you out. I don't have to cry and and weep and moan over the these you, you guys were, were you know which should have already repented, but have not repented. And it's going to break my heart because you haven't been convicted of the sin in your life enough to repent of them, to change your life, to change your heart. And your mind towards something. Paul says, I don't want you to be that way. I want you to repent. Now, 
prior to that, in 2 Corinthians 7, he commends the, those very same brethren. Why? Because in the previous book, he had, he had uh, approached an issue where a man had had his father's wife. We're going to 2 Corinthians. I'm sorry, I minimize that. Uh, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 8 through 10. He'd had his brother's wife, or his father's wife. They were committing adultery. And he wrote to them, and he corrected them, and he told them to cast him unto Satan if he's not going to repent. And they did that which was necessary. And look what happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 10. For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. I, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but sorrow of the world worketh death. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. And <laughs> CJ, don't distract me like that. Uh, I apologize for minimizing that. How's that? <laughs> I was wretched because I minimized it right in the middle when we were supposed to be doing it. But anyway, CJ's calling me on the use of the word sorry. Well, I was, I sorrowed, godly sorrow to repentance, and I, and I repented. See how that works? <laughs> Your audio is kind of a little messed up, brother. Uh, for though I made you sorry with the letter, Paul says, I don't repent of it. I'm not changing my mind and my my life towards it. Though I did for a bit, it made me, you know, it made me change. I wanted to, I didn't want to write that letter. After I sent it, in other words, I, I wish I hadn't have had to. For I perceived that that same letter made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Made you sorrowful, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. You were so sorrowful that it made you repent, changed your mind towards something, changed your heart towards the sin that you were going through, and you made it right. Godly sorrow worketh repentance, and repentance is a turning away due to a conviction of sin. A turning away in attitude and in action because we are convicted of the sin in our life. And, <clears throat> and repentance is really complete uh, when um, it doesn't leave you to change. It, is my audio uh, better? Yeah. Is my audio better, brother? Yes, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, just making sure you all can hear me. It, it's not repent. It's not complete. And lots of makes you want to change. Uh, well, notice first a lot of them, but same text we were just in. For behold, the self same thing that he saw after a godly soul. What carefulness it brought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourself. What ignorant nation. Yea, what fear. What vehement desire. Yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge in all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So, so we can see from that verse that uh, the, this uh, 
the sin that they committed really tore them up. They, they were angry about it. They were afraid. They had a desire. They, they had zeal. They wanted re revenge over it. They wanted to take control of it. And that's what uh, repentance is, stir our emotions to change, it should be very emotional. Uh, when, when you see an X2, uh, remember when Peter said in verse 36, y'all killed Jesus, they were cut to the heart. Their, their emotions were stirred, and, and that led to repentance. Repentance leads us to keep his commandments. Uh, Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Um, so, so uh, again, that change. Uh, if we're living in disobedience and we repent, we're going to want to change and pivot our life and kill his commandments, keep his commandments. Uh, if, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you really change, you will replace it with something good. And going along with uh, repentance, replacing it with something good, think about James 4.17. To him that knows to do good and doesn't do it, it is sin. If you know something's not right and you don't change it, if you're not willing to change and keep his commandments uh, when you sin, if you know that's the right thing to do and you don't do it, that, my friend, is what sin is. True repentance changes due to the desire to keep his commandments due, due to the desire to do good and repentance is is due to desire to the desire to take action uh we'll we'll cover this more uh toward the end of the week but repent and be baptized. DJ, if you would uh, talk about this one in, in conjunction. Um, yeah, so, so, but, per, perfect. Uh, so, so, James 1 talks about being hearers being being doers of the word not hearers only we're going to take action uh verse 22 but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves that, that that's what we're doing when, when we're just listening to the word and and not doing it we're deceiving ourselves and he gives an image if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass for he beholdeth himself and goeth away and straightway forgotteth what manner of man he was but who, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, this man shall be blessed in his deed. 
So, so James says, if you're not going to hear the word in chains, you, you're like a man that looks in the mirror and then walks away and goes, now, now what did I look like? Uh, I, I gotta turn <laughs> around. That, that's how, uh, that, that's how silly James portrays that. So, so it has to be accompanied with action. When you see that you're wrong, it should lead you to do something right. So what we see is that repentance is very important in the plan of salvation. It's actually like it's 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 actually a hitch pin in the whole plan of salvation. You know, up to this point, we've been hearing the word, we've been hearing that Christ, Jesus Christ, is God, that He has the word of life, that He is the way that leads unto life, that He is the way that leads unto God, that He is the door. He has an exclusive way. We have heard that we are supposed to believe in all of these aspects and that God rewards those who seek Him. Not only that all of that God is, that Jesus is, that Jesus has all this, but that God rewards those who do diligently seek Him. We're supposed to hear the gospel message, the fact that you and I have committed sin and stand in need of redemption and that Jesus has offered us that redemption. Repentance is very important. It's vitally important to the plan of salvation. For Jesus says in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, Luke 13, verses 1 through 5, that there were uh, present at the season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus answering says, do you suppose that these guys were, these Galileans were, were sinners above all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? No, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. Or how about those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them? Think you that they were sinners above all the men that dwell in Jerusalem because, you know, in, a, in essence, because they died from a tower falling on them? Do you think they were more, you know, they were they were more full of sin than everybody else that dwelt in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, except you repent, you shall likewise perish. You're just as guilty as the Galileans that uh, <clears throat> Pilate mingled with their the blood of their sacrifices. You're just as guilty as the 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell. You are just as guilty as every other person, every other man or woman upon this earth that has sinned. That is the thing that Jesus says to everyone. We are all guilty. So unless we repent, if we un unless we change our mind, changing our attitude and our action, changing because we are convicted of that very aspect, changing our lives because we desire to do right, we shall likewise perish. For Jesus, uh, Paul, excuse me, tells the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, 29 through 31, that it's time to repent. Acts 17, 29 through 31, listen to his message. These are to the uh, wise men of, Greek, of Greece and of Rome that meet every day in the, in, on the Areopagus on Mars Hill to hear something new, to converse and to think about deep things. He says to them, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven art by man's device. And these time, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, 
and that he hath raised him from the dead. Jesus is the standard by which all men are going to be judged. His words are going to judge every man. And God is calling every man to repent or be judged. Repentance is a pin of the plan of salvation. Jesus said it. Paul said it. Uh, John 12, 48. Let's jump over there real quick. John 12 and verse 48. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. He that rejecteth me, Jesus says, receiveth and receiveth not my words, hath one that judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. See that? Jesus says that my words are going to judge people. My words are the standard. Peter, or Paul says that God has set Jesus as the standard and the judge. Jesus is going to judge us. And God says, everyone needs to repent. You see, God's not willing that any should perish. He wants all of us to come to repentance. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and following. I want you to look at this. I mean, I could go into the prior verses where it talks about the destruction of the world that's going to happen. But look at what it says specifically in three and, and or in Second Peter three verses eight and uh, eight through ten, uh, eight through eleven. Let's put it that way. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that the one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. God is not bound by time. He created time. He's not bound by it. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's not lazy. He's long-suffering toward us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants every one of us to repent and be converted. To repent and believe the gospel. Repent and be converted. Repent and do the will of God. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up. Seeing then that these shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy life and godliness? What manner of person should you be? The obvious answer to this rhetorical question is one of holiness and godliness, having repented and come unto Christ, unto God, into obedience to the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ. God does not want anyone to perish, but all come to repentance. So, in, in closing, we, we have seen... Maybe. <laughs> that we need to respond to the gospel. And we, we saw that the message of the gospel was repentance. And repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of behavior. And we saw that in uh, the the sandwich. Uh, we we saw that in, in John's message that we need to repent and believe of uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We saw that in Jesus's message, and then after Jesus dies, we saw it in Peter's message that we need to repent. We talked about that turning, repentance is turning away an attitude and an action. Maybe it's 
physically turning, getting away from the sin, just turning away. We, we pointed out that we, repentance is turning away due to a con conviction of sin. We're, we're made sorry for sin. And we're striving to do what's right. Our repentance is very important to the plan of salvation. Jesus says in Luke 13, 3, Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So the question we'll leave you with today is, Will you have a repentant attitude when confronted with your sin? Will you repent so you can have everlasting life and enter the kingdom? Uh, th think about these things. Three things I'd like you to remember tonight. Number one, repentance is necessary because all of us have sinned repent and number two change your thinking change your attitude change your life when we change our thinking towards something we believe that that thing is repulsive and no longer desirable we will change our attitude toward it because it becomes repulsive and it becomes undesirable and when we do that we cease to do the repulsive and the undesirable and our life will change. Change your thinking, change your attitude, change your life. And the third thing that you need to remember is that God does not want any to perish, but commands repentance of every person. Amen. Bow with me if you would. Our Father God in heaven, we come before you this evening, standing convicted of sin in our life in many ways. And Father, we seek to do that which is right, knowing that even though many of us have followed your will, we still stumble and fall, and we still need to repent of it. We pray and beg your forgiveness, Father for the sin that we have committed, for the heartache and for the sacrifice that we have caused. We thank you for the sacrifice, the gift of your son, whereby we call you Father. Mm -hmm. Please forgive us in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.